Morning, everyone. Dave Westfall here. Hi, Dave. Hey, Dave. Hey, Kathy. How you doing? Hey, yeah. everyone. Uh, somewhere around 625 bucks. I guess that's Can the caller ending in 881 identify themselves? Cassie, this is Sonia. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're Sorry, welcome. it always says that I'm only allowed to be a um, participant. So I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. We can look at the link that you're calling in on for next meeting and. Okay. I'll just rename you. Hey, Cassie, this is John. Yes. Um, did Dale contact you at all? Do we know? If he asked me yesterday. He may, said he may not be able to attend. He, I have not heard from him today. Okay. And um, I do know that we do have an action item that's no longer going forward this month, and that's the last action item, Greeno Park. Okay. Um, just so you know. John, I did talk to Dale a few minutes ago, and he would like you to at least start the meeting and probably run the whole meeting. Okay. Oh, man, I didn't review. This is Wendy. I was just going to say the same thing, Donna, and, but he did say he was going to try and join. It'll be a little bit late. I think he just left the park a few minutes ago. Okay. Everything is recording on my end. I'm good. And we do have a quorum. So we are ready if you want to start, John. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and call the meeting of the Missoula Parks and Recreation Board to order. And uh, this meeting is being recorded, is also open to the public. The way we're gonna conduct the meeting is that between each item, we will stop to allow for any public comment. There'll also be specific time for public comment on any items not on the agenda. Uh, we'd like to start today with a roll call. Cassie, could you do that? I muted myself. I apologize. Dale. Wendy. 
Oh, there's present. Dale. I'm here. Okay. Dale, I see you just joined. I'm going to mark you as present. John. Here. Sonia. Here. Danny. Here. Margie. Here. Dave. Here. We have a quorum. Dale, do you want to take it from here? You're on mute, sorry. During the meeting, John. Sure, no problem. Thanks, Dale. Okay, our next uh, action item is to approve the minutes from the August 11th, 2021 meeting. Can I have a motion on that, please? I move that we approve the minutes from the August 11th meeting. Is there a second? I'll second, Dave. Are there any corrections or discussions? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Any opposed? Uh, meeting minutes approved. And uh, our first announcement is with Sonia, and it's an exciting one. And what's that? <laughs> Uh, Sonia, do you have your agenda open by chance? Item 1.3 is you're, you're doing the Conservation Roundtable Lifetime Achievement Award for Donna. Whoa, I was unaware of that. I <laughs> am so sorry. So, John? I was um, totally unaware of that. But, hey, Donna, good job. We are super proud of you, and congratulations. Thanks, Sonia. John, we have Ginny and Bruce here in the office today. I think they wanted to go ahead. That's great. Thank you. So we're, we're sort of doing this over again. We already practiced outside once <laughs> with a public one and um, uh, some members were there um, and, and Dale, you were there. Um, I'm looking, um, David, you were there, some other folks. And so we wanted to make sure that all of the park board members were able to um, see and hear um, what, what goes into the award and, and we're gonna represent it to Donna again. So. Um, the Missoula Ro Conservation Roundtable is not a club. It's not an organization with a 501 and that kind of business. It's a group of people who a whole lot of years ago got together and decided that it was important for people who were achieving things in the conservation area be recognized. And way back in the 70s, it kind of started and through an evolution that we won't go into all that history, in the mid 90s, awards uh, were presented in a more formal way and is continuing to this day. So the mission statement for the Conservation Roundtable is this. Um, the mission is to remember, honor, and celebrate leaders who have sustained and protected natural resources in the Missoula area. Our awards inform Roundtable members and the general public about conservation we grow awareness of the continuing importance of conservation, and we inspire others to contribute their time and talents to sustain and protect our natural resources. So over the years, we have um, given now five awards, the Don Aldridge Award, the Arnold Boley Award, the Burke Brandborg Award, the Lifetime Conservation Award, and the Emerging Conservationist Award. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about Donna and Bruce Bugby, if you wouldn't mind doing that. This is a real <clears throat> pleasure for me. Um, I'm uh, a big fan of the Parks Department and its accomplishments over the years, and uh, particularly recognizing that Donna has been a large part of that. Um, the, uh, being with the department for 29 years, um, being the director since 2002, uh, and certainly well qualified uh, to be in that position. And there are bullet points here, which I, I know have come from your website, <laughs> so I don't need to go through them all, <clears throat> other than just simply to recognize that um, it's a diverse um, uh, set of constituent parts that make up our recreation interface with this place, um, including the, the Missoula Forest, which is one of my favorites overall. Uh, seasonally, that's one of my favorite things is to recognize uh, the season when we have the forest and when it 
uh, goes away in the fall and then comes back again. The um, um, Mayor Ingen offers comments uh, that are appropriate. Adana's leadership in the Parks and Recreation Department has benefited our parks, open spaces, and urban forests. We're all in your debt, particularly after weathering a pandemic that kept us closer to home and showed us the importance of living somewhere you can enjoy nature and outdoors without leaving town. From your staff, uh, a strong recommendation uh, that you've always looked ahead, believe that a grand vision will gain more enthusiasm and support than an ordinary plan. If you've pushed the community and your staff to have this visionary mindset, some I, I think I feel like, you know, they got pushed a bit extra. <laughs> um, uh, we're all in, um, excuse me. You have pushed the community and your staff to have this visionary mindset and the result has been many projects over the years that at first perhaps seemed too grandiose, yet have resulted in true community assets. Uh, you listen carefully to what the community wants and you've outperformed our expectations. From me personally about this and from my experience with this group of cohorts in the uh, Conservation Roundtable, um, physical environments are a sense of place and our ability as residents to experience this beautiful place contribute critical and diverse knowledge to us individually, our communities collectively, and how we in our humanity evolve over time. Donna is a person of vision shaped by this place and it has effectively led our way honoring this place we call home. And I would also like to add from a broader perspective and the history of landscape architecture and parks in the United States from Frederick Law Olmsted. Landscapes move us in a manner more nearly analogous to, to action of music than to anything else. Gradually and silently the charm overcomes us we know not exactly where or how. It, you know, that's a, a thought that I find very easy to understand in any one of our parks, whether it's a, a corner playground or Reno or Riverfront or Jumbo Sentinel and so on. Um, there, that's a unique quality that whenever we enter any one of those places, we are absorbed and made better for that experience. And I thank you. Thank you. So um, there are about 80 plus, somewhere in that number, uh, members of the round table who have received awards over the years. Um, and I just want to um, talk a little bit about or mention the people that have received the Lifetime Conservation Award before. And this is awarded for distinguished, well-recognized accomplishment in the areas of natural resources or environmental protection over a long period of time. And these are the previous winners. And the Lifetime Award is not given every year. Um, over the years, there are many years where there's just a name doesn't come up. Uh, but these are the people who have received it in the past. Helen Boley, Bill Taranjo, Senator Max Bacchus, Stuart Brandborg, Smoke and Thelma Elser, Peter Lessica, Monty Dolick and Mary Beth Percival, Jim Weatherly, Kate Davis, Dale Bosworth, Lance Shelvin, Greg and Ryan Newdecker, and this year's award, well, we'll talk about it in a minute. So, so when I think about um, Donna, I think about the things that I learned from her over the years, and we've probably been working together. Well, I had brown hair then, <laughs> a long time ago. Um, we've probably <laughs> done some 12 to 15 processes together. And the thing that I've learned from Donna is that conservation doesn't just apply, environment doesn't just apply when you're outdoors walking on a trail or you're backpacking or you're thinking about open space. It also is connected to the things that we see every day, that the environment is human as well as natural um, and that those two things are wedded. Um, the whole business of conservation related, whether it's farmlands or urban areas, parks, um, wildlands. Um, I learned from Donna that that's all part of a weave. And that was an important lesson for me. Um, when I think about 
in 2000, the year 2000, when the Missoulian gave some money to the community to think about how to spend it. Um, Donna was part of a group of, I don't know, 50 to 80 people who got together and had conversation about that. And she was not the director yet. And she stood up in that meeting and she talked about her vision. And she, she helped all of us think about the fact that Montana is on the Northern tier of the United States and that we are not uh, able to experience the outdoors in the same way as perhaps Southern California or Arizona or even the Southern states. Um, but that doesn't mean that, that the environment is not important to us in, in this Northern tier. And she helped us think about the fact that there are lots of things that can happen in a community regardless of season. And when I look around, when I was driving here this morning and I look around the community and I think of all the things we're here in Currents, think about all the business of Playfair, I think about the trails, I think about um, rope courses, I think about uh, open space, and I think about the absolute importance of the city and parks and recreation working uh, together with um, other organizations to, to have open space in this community. Um, I, I think Donna's job uh, in contributing to all that has been marvelous. So having said that, um, I want to present to Donna our next 2021 Lifetime Conservation Award. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. <laughs> we kind of started to cry outside. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank our, our park board, um, Dale Harris uh, in particular as our president. Um, you know, Dale really helped us uh, transition the park board, uh, create the Conservation Lands Advisory Committee, uh, work with the Open Space Advisory Committee and the City Council to create a really strong governance for our community and for parks and recreation to advance the goals of our community. I also want to shout out to John O'Connor, uh, who has uh, shared many, many initiatives, uh, has linked Friends of Missoula Parks so closely to park board and department goals and all of the board members over all the years, plus the many, many citizens and citizen volunteers and the elected officials who have recognized that stewardship of this place grows um, society, grows community and grows stewards for a lifetime. So thank you, all of you, I really appreciate it. If I could add one quick caveat and, and thank you, Kate. Donna's good work reflects strongly your vision and capacity as a board. And we had many employees uh, earlier today that also I'm very, I feel very grateful for. Um, and so thank you. This, this award extends to all of you and an appreciation for all of you as well. So thank you. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Jenny. Thanks, Jenny. You're welcome. Thank you for uh, being willing to do this as part of your meeting. <laughs> awesome. I, I, I almost feel like we should just adjourn, call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, before we move on, if there's any other comments, if anybody would like to say anything, or if there's any public comment about this award for Donna, now would be a great time for that. Well, this is Wendy Nintman, Parks Board, and I just want to say, Donna, I mean, I've told you this before, but your leadership as far as the people part of parks, um, I've learned so much by watching you and I've, my commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion and making sure that um, all of the wonderful things that we offer here um, in Missoula are available to everybody. Um, I just, I can't thank you enough for your leadership there. And you know, I work with a lot of communities across the West, and I can't think of one that has a better partnership between, you know, the land trust community, land conservation community, and the parks department. And I so appreciate your commitment to equity. Um, thank you so much. You're so deserving of this award. Thank you, Wendy. Well said, Wendy. Any other comments before we move on? We'll now move on to section 1.4, item 1.4, sorry, public or guest comments. Are there any public or guest comments unrelated to the agenda items? I'll see you on Zoom on the 21st. Bye-bye.
I see no comment. Great, then we can move on to our action items. Item 2.1, the batting cage property master plan. I'm gonna turn it over to David Selvage. And David, you're on mute, just so you know. Thank you, good morning, good afternoon. Um, the um, batting cage property uh, is adjacent to the uh, Fort Missoula Regional Park facility. Um, its current condition um, is uh, right adjacent to the uh, uh, Fort Missoula uh, maintenance yard, um, which is a little bit too small. Um, we have engaged all of our neighbors uh, to see uh, if we can do anything with the property to uh, advance their needs and desires. Um, we have uh, come to a um, a, a recommended master plan that seems to make uh, uh, as best use of the of the grounds as possible um, maintains the land and water conservation fund constraint on the fort properties inclusive of this um, and we have uh, found a way to repurpose uh, these the space and reactivate it um, and we've had uh, good input from most of the neighbors around here. We do have a couple of stakeholders who may be joining us. Uh, one is for uh, pickleball and one is for an um, outdoor court, uh, primarily handball. Uh, those, uh, that, those folks go by the name of the Mocha Men. Um, we have also identified that uh, a nicer, newer entry would be desired and expansion of the uh, yard space. I am going to switch to the proposed master plan. Uh, this would provide for uh, up to two new pickleball courts, uh, full size, and then up to two complete uh, uh, enclosed uh, outdoor pick, uh, outdoor handball courts that could be uh, used for other purposes. These are clear, um, clear sides so that you can see through them and completely. Uh, in addition, they're sighted off the main trail going east, which we would extend to connect, create connectivity into the park um, and provide for uh, activation of the space. Uh, there are there are lights along the fence so we can see for crime prevention through environmental design. Uh, a really cool component of this is the addition of a reflection garden um, with a nod to the Japanese internment here. We could uh, come in with a flowering, um, a flowering plant, a uh, flowering tree species here and here, and we could interpret the Japanese internment uh, in the reflective garden area. Uh, there's some enthusiasm to do so from the History Museum. Uh, we would maintain the connections through, and then we would provide an opportunity for um, a modest expansion of, of the uh, maintenance yard. Uh, we basically need some covered storage for dry, dry storage and for equipment. Uh, with that, we would also ensure that we maintain the alley of trees down Fort Missoula Road. Um, and then this misses most of all of our major infrastructure, which uh, slides in between uh, the existing uh, pickleball tennis courts uh, and the Watson's Children's Shelter. Um, so it, overall, it's a, a well-received master plan, public process-wise. We did a, run an open house uh, and we have supplied you all the comments we've received as well as we uh, left a portal open on um, Engage Missoula for several weeks. Um, everything has been supported with only one request or one ask, uh, which was how does this get paid for? And with that in mind, uh, we, would, uh, we have ready partnerships with Pickleball and with the Mocha Men um, that would be our next phase is to move into formal partnerships for fundraising and building those facilities. Um, with that, uh, staff would 
recommend uh, the board um, approve the master plan and recommend adoption to the county. Um, this is a county facility, so the county parks board and then ultimately the uh, board of county commissioners need to act on this in order to change the plan or record for the for the batting cage property. Um, I'll stand for questions. Uh, Dave, do you think it'd be worthwhile to uh, bring up the presentation that's in one of the attachments that you guys did on September? Well, for, for today, that's the slideshow. Uh, we're, we're certainly welcome to. I don't have access to that right this moment. Uh, Has everyone had an opportunity to, to view the attachments from the agenda or have any questions for Dave? There are letters of support that are part of the agenda attachments, along with a further explanation from what Dave's presentation is. Hearing no further questions, um, do we have a motion? I move that the Parks and Recreation Approving support the preferred Fort Missoula Region of Park Condition Master Plan. Thank you, Dale. Is there a second? This is Wendy, and I second. Thanks, Wendy. Is there any comment from the board or discussion? Uh, I'll just say, I, in, in reviewing this, I mean, I know it's less than an acre but that doesn't mean it didn't take a lot of work to go into creating this. And I, I can see that as evidence just by the drawing that David is sharing with us. I really like the inclusion of the reflective garden. And I, I believe that goes along with uh, Fort Missoula Regional Park's emphasis on uh, really showcasing the history, uh, all of it out there and honoring that. So um, I, I thank you for your <clears throat> effort. Having hearing no more discussion or comments, um, we'll go ahead and uh, take the vote. All those in favor of the motion as proposed, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes with unanimous consent. Thank you, David. Thank you. you. You get to hang around a little bit longer for action item 2.2 the Grant Creek Interpretive Signs and Benches. Okay. Uh, if it pleases the board, um, I have uh, two gentlemen here from the Grant Creek Trails Association, um, Tim Burke and... Uh, Kim is not here. Not Kim. <laughs> Bert Lindler. <laughs> Bert Lindler. Lindler. And Wendell, and Wendell Beardsley. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Kim. Uh, okay. Tim Burke. Um, uh, the Grand Creek Trails Association has been working for several years to uh, continue to improve the trail, uh, uh, the Grand Creek Trail, and they have engaged the uh, 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 consolidated uh, Kootenai. Uh, it's the Culture Committee of the Consolidated Salem Kootenai Tribes. Federate. 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 Okay. They've engaged uh, uh, the, the Flatheads uh, and, and uh, Salish tribes, Salish Kootenai. Okay, Salish Kootenai here, excuse me, uh, to create in two interpretive panels out of five. Uh, they have identified locations where they want to do interpretive. I believe those are in your packets, the, the maps of the locations. And they have received the land, underlying landowner permissions where they require it. Um, the, uh, the city's easement for trail is trail only. Uh, and so they've, uh, acquired, uh, they've secured a verbal approval to cite additional uh, interpretive signs. Uh, staff finds their proposal, uh, their, their proposed interpretive um, themes to be appropriate for Grant Creek, uh, Grant Creek Trail. Uh, their production of their first two uh, uh, Interpretive signs demonstrates a high quality and a thoughtful um, uh, text 
and imagery. Uh, staff don't have any concerns about the locations. They're, they can all be cited without uh, conflict and uh, still allow us to do uh, maintenance needs on the site. Um, and I'm recommending uh, approval of all five subject to staff concurrence of the final text and imagery. Alternately, if, this, if the park board does want a greater level of of control over the uh, interpretive signs themselves, you can reserve that to yourself for future proposals. I did receive a third uh, completed um, sign package, but didn't have time to get it into the park board for review. Um, with that, I would like to give it, uh, turn it back over to Grand Creek Trails Association to um, make their pitch to you. And with that, I'll yield the floor. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, David. Uh, Wendell Beardsley, and I'm here with Bert Lindler, <clears throat> who is <clears throat> uh, currently president of Frank Rick Trails Association. Uh, for the association, we'd first like to say congratulations, Donna. You have been a longtime wonderful partner and supporter of the Grand Creek Trail. We also need to thank David sitting here beside me, who is our our always their partner and supporter and helper. Uh, David uh, mentioned briefly what our request is for you today. I think the board referral form is pretty thorough and uh, I'll very briefly review <clears throat> what they are. Uh, it's kind of in three parts, if you will. Uh, first is the production and installation of the two signs that David mentioned. They were produced by the Sage Kootenai Culture Committee of the tribes, the federated tribes. Uh, they are being designed by a local uh, sign designer, Joanna Yardley, who has worked with the tribes for many years on numerous other signs. Uh, if you have seen the signs up at the new Confluence State Park up uh, in Milltown, you have seen examples of her work and it is truly outstanding. Uh, the two signs there, one is an eth what they call an ethnogeography sign. We kind of refer to that as a place name sign. The other is a sign uh, concerning Julia Grant Higgins, the wife of C.P. Higgins, the so-called founder of Missoula. Uh, and then in the second part of our request is for the <clears throat> design, production, installation of these three additional interpretive signs of which for which we have themes or concepts, but they're, they're not yet completely, they're not yet developed. But the concepts we have are number one, the Grand Creek watershed, uh, it's fish and wildlife, <clears throat> wildlife resources, excuse me. And that's being, uh, the work on that is being done in, in cooperation with the Clark Fork Coalition. A second sign will be a focus on Jeanette Rankin and her family, which will be located adjacent to the Grand Creek Ranch. And uh, Grand Creek Ranch uh, manager uh, up there, uh, uh, we've met with her and she's very supportive of the whole concept, excited about it. Um, the third idea that we have for another sign is another sign uh, at a, an existing bench up in the county portion of the trail, focusing on recent uses of the Grand Creek Valley, things like ranching, the dairy farm that used to be up there, the school uh, logging and so on and so forth. Um, we would also mention one other thing for your information that we've been working with David and, and park staff on, and that is some additional benches for the trail. We have engaged uh, some volunteers who are master artists and wood carvers. Uh, they're the people that do the horses at the carousel. And they have indicated a willingness to do two carved benches for us this winter. And in the future, we hope to get them to do some more. Uh, we're currently purchasing some beautiful, clear, old growth, large slabs for those benches. And we would like to install those benches at the locations that I think David has indicated on the map that he sent you. Uh, lastly, again, I mentioned that Grand Creek Trails Association uh, is willing to provide funding for the signs and the benches, including their installation. 
And of course, we would welcome any uh, supplemental financing or contributions that anyone might might be willing to provide. Uh, at that point, I think <clears throat> we would just ask if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Um, does everybody have uh, access to see the, the map that, that David referred to as part of the agenda? Should be in your packet. You can also yes. get it online. Are there any questions about the presentation? Uh, I, I do have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Um, number one, I want to make sure that, um, and I just want to, I'm sure this is the case, but David, if you could just uh, make sure that it's on the record, that any bench or signage will follow uh, City Parks and Rec guidelines for both materials and how it's constructed. Confirmed. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. And then uh, does the Grant Creek Trails Association, you mentioned that you're going to be funding this, but you would also consider donations. Is there a budget for this project? And uh, if so, do you have funds to cover it? Or if not, how much are you looking for from the public? We have funds to cover this. <clears throat> Perfect. Thank you very much. Those were my questions. Mm -hmm. well, with that, I've <clears throat> been in communication with TJ Mikado and Lincoln Lake. Of uh, parks board staff in terms of uh, specifications and so on for all the materials, the park benches and so on. Great. And just to confirm one more thing, uh, David, if you will, uh, the, the proposal is for five interpretive signs, but the attachments are uh, only showing three. So we would be, we would be making a, um, a motion to approve all five with the other two meeting uh, park staff approval. Is that correct? Uh, th the remaining three would be subject to staff approval of text and imagery uh, as long as to ensure consistency with the, with the approved themes. Okay, thank you. If there are no other uh, comments or questions, then I would entertain a motion please. This is Wendy, um, and I would recommend that the board approve the proposed Grant Creek Trail interpretive, the five interpretive sign locations, as I understand it, and themes um, with the last three, is that correct? Subject to staff approval. I, I hope I got that right. Thank you, Wendy. Is there a second? A second. Yes. Second from Dale, thank you. Is there any discussion? Well, this is Wendy again, and I just want to say how important I think it is that um, when we have these trail projects, we put those trails in the larger context of the place and the people. And so I love the CSKT involvement, um, but also just really helping educate people. So it's not just being used for walking and biking and running, but also to help us sort of build our knowledge of this place. So thank you to the association. Mm. And this is Margie, and I want to say that those signs are really well done. I'm really impressed with them. Interpreted in, um, and put it into place the name. They're very well done. If you are not speaking, could you please mute your microphone? Thank you. Okay, hearing no other discussion, um, then I will move for a vote, please. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you all for your work. Thank you, and next year when we get some of these installed, you're all invited to take a walk on the trail with us. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, just uh, I want to add a, a comment here, um, having been out at Fort Missoula last night and talking about the importance of place and recognizing those who, who came before and um, how we fit into the landscape. There was an inter interesting discussion about um, uh, do we have you know, history before Salish settled in this valley? 
Um, do we have artifacts? And I think there are going to be some interesting things happening out at the fort with some of the historical perspectives out there. So I'm excited for all that's happening right now. Thanks so much again for your work. We'll now move on to Jeff with item 2.3, the encroachment easement for 2415 South Hills Drive. Hello everybody, sorry, a few technical uh, issues here. Let me move this over to the other screen. There we go. Much better. Great. Um, thank you. And uh, I am bringing a, an agenda item to the park board um, discussing and recommending approval for an encroachment permit uh, consistent with city resolution 80, or excuse me, 2084. Um, 8024, excuse me, uh, which is the resolution adopting policy and criteria, including um, exhibit A to prevent future parkland encroachments and address current parkland encroachments throughout the city of Missoula. So in um, April of this year, Parks Department received a uh, complaint from a neighbor uh, on South Hills Drive that a, the homeowner at 2415 South Hills Drive um, had blocked park access to the north end of Peary Park um, and had placed signs uh, on the edge of his property uh, indicating that this was not a trail and that it was not, not park property. And so just for reference, this is all included in the agenda um, in the initial uh, site inspection. Here you can see Peary Park outlined. If we zoom in a little bit further, you can see South Hills Drive and you can see 2415, the property in question. If we zoom in all the way, you can see 2415 as well as the Northern extent of Peary Park and the significant encroachment onto park property. Uh, upon further inspection and visiting the site, it's very clear that a significant property encroachment exists. Um, you can see here, this is again looking from South Hills Drive southward, that the majority of the driveway and even a portion of the deck are actually on park property. And so as we move down here through the exhibit, you can see the significant amount of work that has been done over the last uh, 23 years. So the driveway and deck were constructed in approximately 1998. Um, and I will get to that in a minute. However, the current homeowner um, did post signs. Uh, current homeowner vegetated the grass, uh, obviously placed new topsoil, um, placed signs to indicate that this was not public property and not a trail, um, as well as actually uh, came out and discouraged individuals who were trying to cross park property. Um, so upon inspection, the homeowner, uh, I coordinated with um, the city attorney to provide notice to the homeowner that they were encroaching on park property. At that time, I was unaware of how significant the encroachment actually was. We zoomed down to a subsequent property survey. Um, you can see here that the encroachment totals 2,100 square feet. So this includes um, the majority of the driveway, uh, as well as a portion of the deck and a substantial gravel parking pad that is adjacent to the garage. Upon further inspection and um, uh, going back into historic city uh, building permits and documents, we determined that, and I apologize, this is hard to see, it's a microfiche scan, that in 1998, the homeowner at that time properly permitted the construction of the garage that is to the south side of the existing house. Um, however, the driveway was required, they were required to obtain a paving permit and did not do so. And so at this time, they paved, again, um, significantly onto uh, Peary Park property. So all of that being said, um, and 
uh, in line with city resolution 8024, which states that the uh, council has a zero tolerance policy for any encroachments onto park property, existing or new, um, when this resolution was passed in 2015. Uh, we are re actually recommending a um, variance to this due to the scale of the uh, encroachment and um, the fact that this is a functional person or functional portion of this person's yard. So to review, if folks have not uh, reread this resolution, um, there is one very specific process by which a homeowner can request a variance to the zero tolerance policy. And this includes um, only if staff and park board uh, determine that there is a public benefit from issuing said encroachment. Um, that the variance request has a specific uh, fee structure. There is a $495 uh, variance application fee. And then if the uh, variance is issued by council, that the cost of said encroachment permit would be $500 plus a 200 square, excuse me, plus a per square foot value um, as determined by either a real estate appraiser or uh, the average value of the similar uh, type of land, and this is very important, uh, within a very close proximity. So upon doing that, upon learning that, uh, the structure of the permit, as you can see here, this is the draft permit, would allow um, the homeowner to continue to use a portion of the current encroachment. If I go back to the exhibit, the portion of the current encroachment would be the edge of the uh, paved driveway only, and to require them to reclaim the remaining portion of park property. If the zero tolerance policy were to be enforced here, uh, the homeowner would not be able to access their properly permitted garage. Um, and so my view is that, uh, you know, again, it's very unfortunate. I would prefer that all encroachments were removed from park property, but this encroachment has existed for 23 years without any enforcement. And so uh, being reasonable, but also stern in what uh, council has said we will do, um, allowing the homeowner to continue to use this property uh, through the encroachment permit process while also paying uh, for the application fee, permit fee, and using those money uh, monies to directly improve Peary Park. So the money will stay with the park and uh, we have some actually very exciting improvements that we would uh, use those monies for. Um, I mentioned that it's very important uh, to think about the valuation of said property. We all know that the cost of property is increasing rapidly um, in the Missoula Valley. And it was very challenging to try to determine a um, value for this uh, approximately 1300 acres of parkland. So as per the encroachment, uh, the homeowner would not have the ability to do anything other than maintain this as is. Uh, it cannot, you cannot build standing structures. Um, it can only be a driveway and a portion of a deck. And the advantage of the edge of the paved driveway is that it's an enforceable boundary. The edge of the gravel is not enforceable. That can migrate over time. Um, and so what we came up with was looking internal to city operations. Uh, last year, so in August of 2020, um, uh, Public Works actually sold a small 1,600 square foot parcel about a half mile south of the property in question to a neighbor. Uh, this was directly adjacent to a public right of way. Uh, it had deed restrictions where um, uh, standing structures could not be built. Um, it's very similar to this, except for that that parcel was not actually uh, park property. And the property value estimate uh, at that time, granted this was a year ago, was approximately $1.56 per square foot. Um, understanding that property values again have increased considerably. My estimate was that we've had a, an approximately 30% increase in property values in just over one year. And so the estimate uh, for per square foot 
for this encroachment uh, resulted in $2 and approximately three cents per square foot for a total of $2,640.63 plus the required $500 uh, fee. Um, and so the cost to the homeowner would be the um, $2,640 again, plus the $500 fee. There is also a $495 variance permit, excuse me, variance application fee, which would be required to come along with this. Sorry, it's a lot of information. It's been a very complicated process. And from my understanding, this is the first time that this resolution um, has actually been enforced since it was passed in 2015. So my recommendation uh, to Park Board would be to issue uh, the encroachment permit or recommend that council issue the encroachment permit um, consistent with the requirements as shown here, the existing boundary of the paved driveway um, that they would remove the gravel parking pad and reclaim the portion of the park that they have directly impacted and that we would use the money from that permit uh, to directly improve Peary Park. And with that, I'll take questions and I'm sure there will be many. Thanks, Jeff. Any questions uh, for Jeff? Yes, this is Sonia and I do apologize. I don't seem to have that attachment um, in, in front of me here. Um, so we, can people still access the park from by that home after he removes the gravel and all that stuff? Yes. So um, the homeowner did not completely block here. Let me move back. The homeowner did not completely block access. As you can see here, uh, everything that you're seeing in the exhibit, um, including the uh, where the UTV is parked, the gravel parking pad, all of the seated lawn is all Peary Park. Um, so members of the public can still access the park. Um, however, this portion of the park never had any improvements, like a trail. And so we are, um, if anybody's been to Peary Park this spring or summer, uh, our staff did a great job of improving that trail and um, having approximately a 36 inch wide crushed gravel trail uh, on the main portion of Peary Park. We are suggesting to do the same thing here um, and run all the way from South Hills Drive up to meet that, that um, newly improved portion of the trail. Okay, thank you. This is Dale. Has the landowner agreed to this? Uh, sorry, Dale, can you repeat, please? Has the landowner agreed to this? Yes, so uh, we encourage the landowner and their uh, uh, attorney to attend this call. Unfortunately, they were not able to. They would prefer to re uh, retain the parking pad, the gravel parking pad, as you can see in this photo. Um, they would also like us to reduce the price consistently, or excuse me, significantly, uh, for that entire 2,100 square foot encroachment to $2,500 flat fee plus the $495 application fee. Um, that they essentially want to settle at a lower price than what council has mandated. Um, so again, uh, we encourage them to attend this call. They were not able to do so and uh, cannot sort of make their case individually. Uh, the encroachment permit, I believe, has to go to council to be considered as well. And there would be another opportunity where they could call in and uh, participate in that as well. And Jeff, would that be council's call on any kind of settlement? And so the, the financial part of that is not included in this referral, correct? This is just the referral for the easement. The referral for the easement, and then I've included the... <coughs> Uh, I'm going to say fair market value estimate as required under the resolution. Um, yes, if council determines that they want to reduce the price, then they can so choose to. However, that would not be consistent with the original resolution. Thank you. This is Wendy, and I'm I mean, I'm really concerned about the precedent because you said this is the first time we're testing on it, and I'm concerned that we're doing a variance to something that has a no tolerance policy right off the bat. I'm also sympathetic that these uh, folks who own this place 
um, sounds like they're new owners from the original owners that did this. So I do understand that situation, but I, I want to go back to what you, the first thing you said is that to, in order to do a variance to um, our policy, there has to be um, an addition to the conservation or however you read it. And you did say that you would use the money for some exciting improvements. I think it's really important that we hear what those improvements are specifically, because I think that's really important. And I think um, they should be significant. Again, I'm nervous about the uh, precedent setting um, situation here. And I also, I, even though we're not being asked about the fees, I don't feel like we should negotiate on something that's a no tolerance policy. So that's just my two cents. And I, I just want to clarify that what, as it says in the resolution, um, and I'm actually pulling up a map right now, um, that it actually has to be a uh, defined public benefit. So there has to be a public benefit to allowing the encroachment to uh, continue to occur. <clears throat> I will also qualify that in that uh, my program and Morgan as my predecessor and current and preceding staff have mapped dozens, if not hundreds of encroachments onto park property. Um, we have over 2000 individual neighbors onto park, uh, actually just onto conservation land properties. Um, and so it is a large issue. In this case, because we received a direct public complaint um, and that it was very obvious that this homeowner was actively doing work. I know they were not actively paving the driveway, um, we issued them notice and moved forward with this. So I guess my question then is that I personally would like it to be articulated what the additional public benefit is because we already had a park there. We had access there. There was an encroachment. You're gonna use the fee money to do some exciting improvements on the park, which would be additional um, public benefit. I just think the public benefit piece is really important here. It's a trust thing to the public, you know, the parks department, it's our job to hold these things for the public. So that's just, uh, I would be curious to, I just think we should hear really clearly what the additional public benefit is, and that should be part of our decision-making process. I agree, Mr. Deal, I agree with Wendy. So, so Jeff, I'm curious, what is the public benefit? Well, so again, that's up for park board to determine whether or not this is suitable to issue the variance. Um, my suggestion is to use those funds to improve the trail system in Peary Park significantly. Currently, and I'm, I've pulled this up on the map, we will zoom in here. There is no trail, uh, again, it's, it's park property, but there's no trail running from South Hills Drive all the way up to the recently improved trail, East-West Trail um, in sort of the core of Peary Park. I'm gonna suggest that we use these funds to pay for staff time and materials to construct a trail along this area, connect to the adjacent uh, cul-de-sacs, which abut Peary Park, as well as improve uh, and replace missing signage that has been lost in the past. Has there been a trail in the, in the, in the, in the I'm not sure how to ask this question. Let's say that we're not, we weren't talking about a variance. Would the trail initiation be, be in this, in this, this park? Dale, can you repeat that? I'm just trying to, never mind. No. Um, I, I think, think he's just, oh, go ahead, Donna, sorry. Well, so we don't currently have funding for trail improvements here. And because of the number of cul-de-sacs, interesting enough, um, it makes a very roundabout um, trip for an individual to get from one uh, neighborhood resident to another neighborhood resident what the uh, corridor trail that Jeff is recommending and trail improvements, I think would be really well received by this broader neighborhood. Um, Jeff did mention that this is the first time we've applied the resolution as is. The resolution passed following our work with a number of encroachments and, and those encroachments have been all over the community in virtually every single neighborhood. And some of them um, Park Board has seen uh, before the resolution passed. Uh, we had a similar type encroachment in Whitaker Park 
And those funds, um, that was moving a yard fence uh, and we permitted that to happen because the area where the fence was located did not necessarily provide uh, any useful recreational activity, but the funding to help us deal with um, master planning that park and working with the neighborhood and applying it to some of the neighborhood goals worked. The other one that some of you might remember is High Park. Uh, we had an encroachment there. Uh, we did a very, very similar process. So this resolution was written after some of these encroachment processes because those processes were working. And what we got out of that um, was some cash. And we had the ability through a um, pretty deep ravine to connect a whole nother neighborhood to a, a park. And so I think that's what Jeff is proposing here is the, the net public benefit is a greater level of connectivity greater quality trail, um, so more access, uh, more inclusivity. While I completely agree with the board that we don't wanna give up any parkland and it's precedent setting, it is also an incredibly difficult place to tell somebody to, to remove um, big um, costly improvement components. Um, they did not get the permit for paving, so not acceptable, uh, but we, we find this quite often across our community where people are not getting proper permits. And then the initial improvements were actually permitted. And that's something we also deal with um, over history is not a thorough, thorough review and understanding where all the <clears throat> plans are. Hey, Donna, this is John. Um, didn't we have one other incident that um, I recall that wasn't on developed parkland, but was on um, on Jumbo. Yes, and that was uh, that was just the lower rattlesnake, just north of the interstate, where there was an actual structure built into the area. And this was again before we came up with this resolution, and we had to go through a similar process there. It, it very very similar. Um, there was a carriage house that was built partially on conservation lands. And uh, so we were in the situation of either requiring them to remove their carriage house, and literally move it or allow for the encroachment and charge um, market value. So again, Wendy, I'm really, I am empathetic to, um, you know, the cost of having to remove something like this and I'm not advocating that, but could we, um, I just wanna make sure we go on record stating that additional public benefit really clearly. Um, and I also wonder, have we ever asked like a neighborhood council for a letter of recommendation or just as part of our process moving forward because there's so many of these. Um, I think, I mean, I put heavy weight on staff recommendation but it would be great too to have the neighborhood council or whoever say, you know, this will be uh, a great benefit to us. And that's just, I'm not asking for that today. I'm just putting that out there as a thought for the future. So this yes. is Marky, and I wanna uh, second what Wendy said. I'm leery, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable with uh, setting a precedent and allowing a paved driveway on parkland because I've had experience in the past as a district ranger where I've people innocently quote unquote build cabins and all kinds of things. And by the way, I did make them move to everything, but, but I know you have a different situation here because um, it is his only access to his garage. That's the only reason I would allow this paved driveway. Otherwise I would not at all allow that paved driveway to stay on parkland. And, and um, but it is a precedent setting. And so every time there's another encroachment and somebody goes, oh, I didn't know I needed to put a driveway in. And I mean, there has to be some time where the it's like, no, you have to remove this. I, it's just scary to me to, it's a slippery slope because other people will know and they'll cite it and the attorneys will cite it. And pretty soon it's like little bits and pieces because uh, of parkland start disappearing because of this. So it's just, um, I am a little concerned about it. And um, I would definitely agree with Wendy is do not negotiate a different price and get rid of the gravel pad and the embankment thing behind that ATV. I think that's not, that's public land. It doesn't need to be there. So. Jeff, this is Dave Westfall. Um, I have a question about the history of ownership. I think you mentioned earlier that um, 
the current owner uh, purchased the, the, the this property relatively uh, a short time ago. Is that true? And was this driveway already on the property when they purchased it? Correct. So the uh, prior owner uh, who applied for and secured the proper building permit for the garage did so in 1998. That right. homeowner uh, sold to the current owner, uh, Brian Weston, in 2012. So, okay. um, you know, interestingly, when the property changed hands, there was no inspection of the property lines. Um, and the fact, I mean, this is a very significant encroachment. Um, yeah. Typically that would have come up. I would have think I'm currently looking for a house right now. And so I understand the types of documents you need to review. And so, um, you know, typically that would come up in a disclosure as an encroachment uh, or easement. And in this case, apparently it did not. So that's important because if, if this, if, if they bought this and, 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 and the title company that is responsible for um, guaranteeing you know, the, 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 what the property lines actually are and if it's encroaching on, on someone else's property. If they received a title commitment at time of purchase it, it, and, and it didn't, for some reason, I would find it hard to believe that it didn't find this out or discover this, but if it wasn't discovered and they bought it under the pretense that that was actually their land, I would be shocked, but they would have a leg to stand on, I think. Uh, but I, I, I think maybe we have to research that a little bit more and discover uh, it, you know, what that title commitment said. I'm going to to Craigle too. I'm sorry? I, was, I, I can't believe that the title, just because the title company failed to dis, uh, or somebody failed to do a appropriate survey that suddenly entitles somebody to land I, i'm just i don't know enough about it maybe but i just don't see how that could be accurate that means if somebody i mean if you look at it on a larger scale if you if somebody bought, brought a piece of property or land and built on it and um i mean in a neighbor's yard i mean you know it's like we had neighbors and um to put their fence on our on our property at prospect and we asked them to move it and they thought they it was part of their property and um because the title company had not disclosed it, but that doesn't give them my property all of a sudden because the title company re didn't disclose it. Yeah, I, I understand your point. My my guess, and and I and again, I would I would ask Brian uh, Weston to uh, furnish us or his attorney to furnish us with the title commitment because my guess is that it was discovered. My guess is that. Uh, the title company did know that this was an encroachment on on park lands and that, that this current owner who bought it in 2012 um you know just bought it knowing that that he could end up in this situation so, so, so I, here are I, a couple of suggested improvements um and whether or not that comes back to park board next month or moves on to council that will be decided but improve the specific language in the draft permit to discuss the um, uh, proposed improvements to Peary Park. So how the funds will be expended um, and probably including a map, I can happily do that. And then also to request uh, the title commitment from the current owner um, on whether or not, so additional document discovery essentially on whether or not uh, they were aware of the encroachment at that time. Uh, thanks, Jeff. So uh, before we do that, though, let me just make sure I understand the, the board's um, board's wishes here. Uh, do we want to move forward with any kind of uh, motion, whether that language might be altered to include something more specific about the public benefit? Or would it be our preference to table this action item until our next meeting to give Jeff some time to get more information to help us make a decision? Well, this is Wendy and um, I'm a little nervous about the title stuff because I'm just not sure, um, you know, I mean, I agree with what um, 
has been said, I'm not sure we want to get involved in that. I think we should, I guess, so my thinking is I just like more time. I would like to, or at least have the um, recommendation modified to really clearly articulate the public benefit and even maybe see if we could get a letter from somebody in the neighborhood, just because it is so significant and because we have so many more of these um, to deal with. So that's, but I'm okay tabling it. I'm just not, I'm not sure we want to go down the road with the title, reviewing title, but I would leave that to staff to tell us whether that's appropriate. Thank you, Wendy. Any other comments or would anybody like to make a motion? Not me. All right, Jeff, I think you've got your answer. We'd love for you to come back next month with this and table this action item until that time. Great. I Thank you that. very much. Really appreciate your uh, thorough presentation of all the information. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. We're going to move on to action item 2.4, the Greeno Park after hours request. And that's Shirley and Jeff as well. This is the action item that is no longer. Oh, I'm sorry. Going. Yep. That's Great. Okay. Thank you. You told me that. No worries. We're going to skip that for now, and we'll move on into the presentations and discussions then. And we're going to start with the day in the life of program specialist, Garrick Swanson. And I do not see him on the call, and he's not responded to my communication, so I think we can move um, on. Excuse me. ended oh, up with uh, having to uh, provide child care, uh, so he will probably join us in October. He, he apologizes. He really wanted to be here with the park board. No problem. We'll skip that for this month and we'll move on to item 3.2 subcommittee reports. Um, updates from CLAC and OSAC liaisons. Daniel, do you want to go first? He left the meeting. So it's you, John. Yeah, I'll start yeah. dancing like I did last time. He was only able to attend for about the first half an hour and he stayed longer and had to leave. Um, good to note, maybe in the future, we probably, if we have time commitments like that, we can rearrange the agenda and okay. just give us a heads up. All right. So I will give uh, uh, just a quick update. Last night, uh, CLAC and OSAC had a joint meeting out at the Fort Missoula Ponds. It was awesome. Um, Jeff and Morgan and Donna and Joe uh, were out there. There were uh, public folks from the Missoula Audubon Society, from Clark Fork Coalition, from um, um, what is Annie's organization called, Donna? Learning with Meaning. Learning with Meaning, correct, yeah. And we got to tour the ponds and talk about the public process that will be upcoming on the pond use. We got to see some of the natural environment, uh, also see some of the damage to the river and the riparian area and talk about the ponds and the types of waterfowl and other animals and critters there. It was really a wonderful field trip. Um, I gotta say, Jeff, you're doing an awesome job. You're a great addition to the team. Thank you for all the information you provided. So, um, you know, being on CLAC has been super interesting for me. It's kind of opened my eyes to a whole other realm of parks and recreation that I had not previously really delved into that much. And I'm, I'm very much appreciating the different mindsets and different viewpoints that people come from. I think it was an awesome move on um, the city's parts to, part to have those Mount Jumbo and Greeno people come together and have CLAC. It's been um, a wonderful experience for me. So that's my update from the CLAC meeting. If anybody wants to add anything else, please go for it. Thanks for doing that, John. It's great. Jeff, do you have anything you want to add from last night? Um, not specifically. I, we did have a great group of people in total, including staff, CLAC, OSAC members, and interested members of the public. We had 28 people. Um, and so it was a great meeting and uh, you know, a great opportunity to introduce folks uh, to that site and to the upcoming uh, public right. planning process next. for later this year. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add a couple more things. I, I think oh. that people don't really understand, uh, our general community probably hadn't thought about or doesn't understand all that goes into a, 
process like this. I mean, we had a field trip last night. Awesome. But before that field trip, there have been months and months of research and data collection that's been undertaken by staff to both determine the types and numbers of waterfowl, but also whether fish are there or what other invasive species are there like bullfrogs and toads. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into it even before it's brought to us and then even more before we can bring it to the public. And um, it's, you know, there's so many people that have different passions. It's always interesting when you get the public coming because you have this very passionate group about uh, conservation for waterfowl. And then you have another passionate group about education um, in nature. And it's just uh, great to hear that. And, and that's why the public process is so important so we can gather all that information. All right, thank you. Uh, moving on to item 3.3, service and systems, fleet safety and training update by David. Man, we're getting you a lot today, David, making up for lost time. You're on mute. Somebody should have talked to uh, you guys about having to look at me that many times. <laughs> um, uh, but I do have a new staff member I would like to introduce if you'll slide on over here. This is Frank Nat. Frank is... Uh, Hi, Frank. Frank comes to us from uh, a uh, Canadian uh, builder. Construction, big, construction, construction safety. Big yeah. construction safety. Um, and he is going to help us move us into the um, actually providing training services on a regular, more regular basis here. Um, Frank is also um, picking up a lot of low hanging fruit. Uh, with the, a sort of sort of coming out of COVID, we're getting ready to be safe out in the field again. Uh, but uh, Frank is grabbing the reins and going forward, and uh, you'll probably see a little bit more of him around here. Uh, so I am I'm extremely pleased. He's got a great skill set, uh, despite the fact that he's a Notre Dame fan. <laughs> um, oh, you know what can you say? <laughs> So um, anyway, uh, a big welcome to Frank. Uh, welcome, Frank. Yeah, glad, glad to be here, and I am a Grizz fan as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you next week when the, when the Boilermakers beat those fighting Irish. That's not going to happen <laughs> in, your, in your dreams. <laughs> okay. All right, well, we set a small mark there. Um, Greetings and welcome, everybody. Um, I've been kind of busy lately. Um, you know, keeping up with the comet uh, Donna is uh, always a challenge, and I seem to get a lot of comet dust sprinkled on me. Um, of, of late, uh, I put together a cash in lieu appraisal service uh contract we've got finally we got two respondents for cash and lieu uh to subdivisions uh so we're going to move that forward and i guess i'll be writing contracts for those as well for those services that's uh when developers um need to give money instead of parkland um i have been uh uh Fortunate to be able to apply for a land and water conservation fund for the West Side Playground. And uh, it looks like we're going to get uh, a nice little $450,000 bump on that. Um, but like everything that I touch, it seems like there's a lot of bureaucracy to get through to get to a final yes. Um, I uh, am uh, working also in land and water. I have a number of projects that I have to do uh, changes of use for, including Karis Park. Uh, we finally nailed down an exchange with uh, City Public Works Department to uh, get a, the end of Patty Street for a, a, a lane widening at, uh, next to the pavilion in Karis Park. And then uh, the baseball uh, property, uh, batting cage property is a land and water conservation fund site that we'll also have to uh, show that we're going to change the uses on. The packet's about six inches thick for those. So lots of fun, fun bureaucracy to work with. Um, the, uh, I, I would like to announce that we are going to receive a pavement preservation grant from the state uh, Fish, Wildlife and Parks. 
Uh, that will be used next year to uh, crack seal and seal coat as much of the Milwaukee, Bitterroot and Grant Creek trails as we can get done. So that's a, that's a nice little 70, $60,000, $70,000 uh, bump to our budget uh, to take care of uh, much needed cyclical maintenance on our trail system, make them last a little longer. The, um, we, we've been, uh, as you're all aware, we're, COVID's still here, still hanging around. Uh, and we still have not passed transmission amongst our staff that we know of. So that's a huge deal, keeping all of our staff safe, uh, masking and going through the, uh, all the variations of, that the staff will throw at us about why they have to wear a mask and stuff like that. Um, we are, uh, we do have a grant proposal into the Montana Department of Transportation to repair and uh, renovate the Northside Trail. It looks like we're going to get that. Uh, lots of questions up in the air, um, but uh, we had, uh, we're, it looks like we're gonna be successful on that. The amount to be awarded in the exact scope of work are yet to be worked out. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be assigned two projects to work with the state on uh, the Grant Creek interchange uh, is nearly wrapping up uh, the site restoration for that left turn lane there and the safety improvements around there. We're, we're trying to button that up. Uh, the Van Buren interchange is completed. Uh, we're dealing with some uh, uh, due diligence issues with uh, irrigation systems. Uh, we get, we've got the state to fund some missing components uh, and we're pressing on them to deal with some other issues that we've discovered. Uh, the uh, other things that I'm doing here is I'm updating our park asset management plan as we uh, make improvements to the system and expand and add to the system. It's getting really close to having to do a comprehensive update, which I'm hoping that uh, the developed parks team will help me with. Um, the South Reserve Ped Bridge is, uh, as you're aware, there's an electrical uh, issue with the deck heating system. Uh, we have been pressing on the general contractor, which was Jackson Contracting Group, to uh, affect the warranty with the manufacturers of the deck, and uh, they're refusing to participate, even though it's under warranty. Uh, we've got city legal and uh, MRA uh, engaged with that process as well, but mostly everything's on the uh, uh, general contractor's shoulders for that. Um, thank you for the uh, yes on the Grant Creek interpretive signs. They, that's been a, a, a couple years in the, uh, in the works for that group here. Uh, and it's awfully fun to support some groups that feel like they've had it, just had a successful run with you guys. So thank you. Um, the, uh, uh, at present we're pur I'm purchasing some, um, infill rubber chips for Fort Missoula, uh, the Bella Vista field. Uh, we appear to have, have lost almost 40,000 pounds of that material over the last three years. Uh, so it's time to rep replenish the field. Where to go? That we would like to know that ourselves. We, we think that what it is, is it's a combination of uh, when, we sh when we allow it to be shoveled by our user groups, is we think that's where the primary is going, but it could also be wind driven. What we know is that we're not seeing a soft spot in the field, so it's not tracking use. It's not, the, not user groups moving the material out um, because we would have soft spots in the field that we could deal with with a our uh, maintenance equipment. Um, the, um, uh, you know, there's always stuff that I'm, I'm, I'm getting assignment, new assignments on, and I'm getting excited, trying to get excited about a, a community development block grant proposal coming up here uh, that we're gonna focus on uh, downtown Lions Park and trail lighting. Um, that would be a really cool ask. We've got 
fair amount of money available in the CDBG program and uh, Missoula Redevelopment Agency and others could be potential partners on that. Uh, we were working forward with a group called uh, Native Americans Against Drugs and Alcohol and the uh, uh, Tribal Health Center here locally to uh, uh, do improvements over there, try to deal with some of the um, disinvestment issues, uh, crime, recidivism, drugs and alcohol that occur, and then the lack of appropriate use at downtown Lions Park. So uh, hopefully that uh, makes for a sea change at that park if we're successful with that grant opportunity. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, I had a role in the, uh, uh, the new power line renovations over at Tool Park for 4th Street. Um, that is nearing finishing here. If you, uh, beautiful paving job, um, beautiful work by our crews to rough up the riparian edge and start to create a better buffer against the river. Uh, check it out if you haven't seen it. And um, with that, I would stand for questions. I know I, I, know I usually throw my uh, uh, work plan in for you guys. So anytime that anybody has questions about Dave's work plan, you're welcome to give me a call. Okay, Dave, I have a, I have a question. Wendy, you want to go ahead? All I was going to say was it's really impressive that you're getting money from both Land and Water Conservation Fund and the Pavement Protection Fund, which I've never heard of before. But anyone who can simultaneously get money from both of those sources has got to be pretty talented. And <laughs> the LWCF, that's just really great um, to see that coming through here because that was key in getting Mount Sentinel done. Um, the Forest Service piece of that. So it's a huge lift, like you said, but that's a lot of money. So good work. Thank you. I would be remiss not to say I have a lot of help when I get into these grants. There's a, a lot of borrowing from others. So thank you very much. David, I was just going to ask a question that more, might be more of a comment, but uh, in our last item with Jeff and the encroachment, I was reminded that we allow for temporary encroachments that you have to deal with quite often from, for example, Northwestern Energy, people like that where they encroach on parkland. And uh, a process that I think, or if I remember correctly, Susan Ridgway kind of drove, and it's been a, a number of years back now, was to include in the easement, the temporary easement language, um, inform, or I guess articles that allowed the city to inspect any repair or restoration work before that easement process was um, complete. And also requiring the temporary easement folks to be liable to pay for those repairs. And so I'm wondering if some of that experience might help with uh, some of our concerns with, with the easement that Jeff's dealing with, because it's not just about park improvements, but you know, if you look at that side lot, it's a it's a maintained yard. It's cut, looks like it's been watered and fertilized, and there may be a need to restore that back to uh, native parkland space or something. But you might maybe there's some uh, information that you have that would help Jeff in that process. Uh, uh, John, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we've gotten a lot better at holding uh, people accountable for when they use parklands and ensuring that uh, the public is public land values are maintained. Um, in this particular encroachment that Jeff's dealing with, uh, they have they have excellent experience turning irrigated green grass areas back into native uh, appropriate vegetation. As you're all aware, the South Hills is pretty important for deer winter range at times. Um, and, uh, you know, this is just one encroachment. There are at least a couple others up further up in the parklands that we still have to deal with. Uh, this is something that none of us really care to do just because it uh, takes away from our mission and our staff time on doing other things. But at the same time, it's incredibly important as we can tell just by your conversation on the matter. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for David? Sorry about looking at me three times in one day. 
Do we have, have any one. public comment? Uh, John, I just wanted to say um, David has um, throughout his career here, but especially the last two years, um, he has taken on the most complicated, arduous, difficult project time after time after time and found us a way through it. So I just I want to publicly thank Dave for that. We'd like to find a way to yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you Eric, for all that you guys do too. Goodbye. I know. Ryan, thank you for your patience. Uh, we're on item 3.4 now, and that's the mayor's budget review, fiscal year 22 budget CIP. Hello. Thanks, y'all. And if I could ask for your patience one more time while I reconnect to my server so I can share my screen. Good to see everyone. You too. Let's see. So Donna and I did, um, and I should say the city council did adopt fiscal year 22 budget. Donna and I did present um, at the end of August with about, what was it, four days before final adoption of the budget, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. So there was a lot of back and forth to um, make sure all the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted and, and it will um, bleed over a little bit into some Q1 budget amendments um, to get make sure that we um, got everything that was intended to be um, funded. Um, that said, I think, um, the presentation went pretty well. I, I'm starting, if everyone can see my screen, kind of, and, and want to go over today, what was funded through Park District, what was funded via um, other means in our annual appropriations, and then re review a little bit um, of what was funded on capital projects. Um, so, this is kind of what, where we focus are um, and in line with, um, we believe um, city council or city priorities and park board priorities. Um, and then in the mayor's budget, which was approved, um, kind of this first orange box um, includes our 3% um, non-union wage increases. Union wage increases are included in the baseline budget, um, whereas non-union are not. So that's why they show up here. Um, a small increase for Fort Missoula Regional Park, which is um, met with a, a kind of likewise increase from the county side to keep up with inflationary pressures a little bit and staffing um, increases. And that was at 10,407. And that's a transfer out of Park District into the Fort Missoula Regional Park Management Fund, the Operations and Management Fund. Um, so that's why it shows up here as an increase um, in, in, in Park District. And then contractual and utility increases for a total increase of 56,124. Um, those are sometimes what we call baseline increases. That was funded. Um, in Park District number one does have a tax impact. Um, two recreation staff um, at the coordinator level for more direct service of our recreation programs were funded, which we're really excited about. Um, this was funded through a mixture of um, tax increase at this 41813. Um, a one time, this is to get folks set up with computers and everything they need, and then that won't be available next year. But that is um, a tax increase for this year. And then a fee for service increase in our budget. Um, so for our program fees, and also conversion of already existing intermittent salaries to help fund two classified salaries. And this is exploring getting the right mix of classified full-time staff to um, our season, more seasonal focused staff. Um, so we're excited about that. And then uh, another member of the um, customer service team was funded again um, through an increase in um, park district 
some fee for service increase and again converting a smaller amount of um, existing payroll from our intermittent salaries. Um, so those are kind of the tax implications of from our new requests that were funded. Um, and then we did other items funded hey, that were. Hey, Ryan, go back for a second. Yep. Like when you lay, you're laying this out. Did I did I miss a question? Dale, did you have a question? I have a connectivity problem. Ah. Go ahead, Ryan, and we'll come yeah, back. Okay. So that that's kind of our request from the park district angle. Um, quests that were funded one time with um, no new tax impact. Um, in the mayor's budget, um, this was uh, the park asset management um, for our deferred and cyclical maintenance, our deferred maintenance. Um, mayor gave 90,000 and was, well, that was approved and we actually were approved for more, which I'll talk about that and how we, how we identified using fund balance. So our park asset management asked, which we've been asking to address deferred maintenance started at 90,000 using park district fund balance and to help with capacity increases for our recreation program, we were approved to use fund balance of our, of our um, park district number one for two recreational vans, um, similar to what we have in our fleet now that allows us to transport usually up to 12 um, um, participants in our programming. Um, then we did get some ARPA funding, the American um, Recovery Plan Act funding, focused on equity um, and providing programs um, to all Missoulians, um, especially um, the low LMI neighborhoods or lower income families and people. Um, this included equity and after school programs to allow us to continue our sliding fee scale that we've been offering since the beginning of the pandemic for out of school and after school programming. It also includes a one-time increase to our summer scholarship um, to continue an avenue of, of funding that because that has really increased, um, especially over this summer. Um, some uh, um, minor upgrades to the Lowell Neighborhood Community Center that were identified in our budget request, and then helping to do the fixed cost at the base facility for this year so we can hold programs both in the smoke and the winter in, in the winter um, months. Those are coming from ARPA designated funding. Um, I just got off a phone call with finance about how we're gonna handle that. Um, and then the existing conservation and lands and stewardship um, also funded um, for one vehicle um, and partial funding for a maintenance worker. We didn't get full funding for this. We did get some budget authority to potentially hire an intermittent staff um, to help, but not for the maintenance worker we were asking for. Um, so that was in our mayor's budget. That was, and that's what we're moving forward. I do want to also talk about um, two priorities that were, I, I guess I could also talk about what, what was not funded um, because that's important to us as well. Um, a lot of our unfunded trails, which we've been carrying forward, um, unfunded developed parks um, for Montana Rail Link and Jeffrey Park, which are some newer parks in the system, haven't got their full funding as, as indicated by maintenance impact statements. We've been carrying those forward. Um, and then the final operations of Redfern Park, um, we were just asking for a, a smaller amount to cover our um, utilities at that area. 
that did not get funded. The full increase is, is at that 24,000. So there are some, you know, newer items that have brought online that are not fully funded and we're having to, um, you know, spread out services. So we cover everything to the best of our ability. Um, Park District, so this is, we did not get the CLM urban forestry maintenance worker position funded in full, only 10,000 from the, from the CLM levy, not the, uh, you know, I tried to also put some existing payroll and convert some park attendant dollars into the maintenance workers that did not get funded this year. So we'll still be working towards that. Um, the MDT projects, especially as associated with Russell, Orange Street and, and Van Buren did not get funded this year. So that's another in our Greenways and Horticulture and Develop Parks and Trail program that we're gonna have to cover for another year. Um, and then we did not get an, an aquatics operations position funded. Um, you know, this will help us and, um, you know, train a person to operate our pools and relieve some of the duties of our aquatics manager um, that did not get funded this year. Um, we did get some more fund balance prioritizations funded. Um, and these we can talk about a little bit more. Um, we got an additional um, $21,428 out of fund balance to help with our scholarship fund. And that would put the total allocation for our scholarship fund from half, about half ARPA, 28,000 in ARPA and 21 of our park district fund balance um, to help with our growing scholarship program. Um, and we need to continue to work on, on consistent revenue streams for our scholarship program. So that's something that we've been, we've been starting to collaborate on um, for that. Um, we did get funding to purchase a grapple boom truck for our urban forestry program, which is really helpful for efficiencies and forest operations, it allows us to bring one piece of equipment instead of two, um, a big safety efficiencies as well in terms of not having people as close to trees as, as possible, cut a tree, load it up all in one, on, in one time instead of having to come back. Um, and then we did get an, a, a, like last year, a $28,000 one time um, increase based on fund balance for our aquatics. Um, this is kind of for our operations of aquatics. It's not a um, end all be on. We, we've had, I think when I started, it was about a $203,000 park district um, transfer into the aquatics fund. It's now at a $250,000 transfer. Um, and we're trying to get it up to about a $280,000 transfer. Um, we got there with a one-time funding for the last two years based on fund balance. Um, but this is something to look at um, in terms of increasing costs to operate the pools without increasing revenue or attendance at the pools. So. Um, it's just a, a challenge that we're in and we'll, we'll continue to, to work on. Um, the, uh, we did also get out of fund balance um, funding to continue work on the parks, recreation, open space and trails update to the master park plan. This is $125,000 funding to do a, a large update and add on to the open space um, chapter that has been completed so far. Um, and so we'll be looking to um, do that. Um, we did get 30,000 um, funding, um, which isn't full funding for our turf management, um, but we got 30,000 to buy a nutrient spray tank um, to help us with kind of weaning off where appropriate um, pesticides um, and, and manage more holistically. Um, and then a large one, which we can look at a little bit more as an increase to our neighborhood parks in the form of sport court renovations um, and two new bathroom renovations. Um, this is park district fund balance funding 
Um, all of the park district fund balance funding that I'm talking about here would still leave the required 7% or about 500,000 in our fund balance. Um, over the last two years or three years really, our fund balance has grown pretty significantly and it's nice being a component fund and out of the general fund, um, we are able to reinvest that. Um, so this um, funding in particular is the um, Parks Department went through um, and listed our, what we're calling our tier one or our sport courts and most need of replacement. Um, and that's up here on this list, Maryland Skyview, Honeysuckle, um, I put a square foot estimate based on a recent um, project we've done. Um, and so that is around 40, 430,000 of that to, to replace those sport courts. Um, some pictures um, here of what we will be replacing. And we're also looking at kind of updating it to potential um, capacity increases, whether it's adding a futsal, um, whether it's other kind of pickleball or, or what. So we're starting to look at, okay, how do we give, you know, on our sport court areas, a, a appropriate facelift to these neighborhood parks. Um, hey, Ryan. Yes, this, sir. This is John. Two questions on your prior slide, and you probably said it, but I probably just didn't hear you. When it says um, it's funded, but the mayor funded zero, what does that mean? On my prior slide, it means that it was added by city council as part of the final budget negotiation process. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. And then yep. when you say sport courts, does that include tennis courts or are those considered separate? The only one that is included in this would be Maryland baseball and tennis. Okay. Sorry if it's small. The other one, or basketball, I should say, the other one are traditional basketball courts right now. Um, and so, so Playfair is not considered in these tiers yet. Playfair is not considered in these tiers, though I believe we are working toward a um, resurfacing of Playfair. Okay. Um, to extend the longevity of it. Thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, and so, and then prioritizing getting a, a vault bathroom back at Greeno, um, which we lost several years ago in a storm. And a uh, restroom, I think the idea is similar to what we did at West Side for the spray deck at, at Sacagawea. So we're excited about those. Um, you know, here is kind of our prioritized fund balanced allocations, um, which is, you know, that aquatics contribution, more to the summer scholarship, master planning efforts, replacement of those tier one and bathrooms added to that 90,000 that the mayor funded um, beyond pesticides equipment, getting a grapple boom into our fleet. Um, and yeah, that's, that's, and then this is kind of a, a total of that, of that. So that's kind of, it was a busy budget process at the end and we're, we're trying to catch up with ourselves right now and, and, and incorporate those into work plans. Um, and, Happy to entertain questions on the appropriation side, or I try to answer them the best that I can. And Donna, if you want to um, add anything, please. Thanks, Ryan. Any questions for Ryan? Do we have any public comment? No public comment. Uh, seeing none, Ryan, thank you for putting this in a format that makes it easier for us to understand. I know it's a lot of work and a lot of numbers moving. So yeah, thank you and very if much. You, if you see Becky too and Jolanda, thank them as well. <laughs> Great. Well, Donna, that means we finally have some time for a director's report. You always get pushed off the end. <laughs> so item 3.5, uh, director's report, department update. Sure, um, and thank you. A uh, couple of comments. Um, huge thanks to Ryan. Uh, he does a fantastic job of 
understanding the entire department and the needs of every single division and then putting that into a numerical and graphical pictorial um, story that I think is pretty readily understood uh, by our community and, and quite frankly by our staff. Uh, some of the um, late ads in those last four days uh, were a result of property values being a bit better than we thought and the fact that um, CARES and ARPA funds, at least during the first phase of the pandemic before the, the variant, uh, helped us recover uh, additional costs and in some case uh, help recover some revenue losses. And so um, none of this is, uh, you know, while we didn't get everything we asked for, we're really pleased with the ability to invest in those local neighborhood courts. And as Ryan mentioned, we're going to try and make every court as, uh, perform a double use if we can. So basketball with pickleball, basketball with futsal, which is a, um, it's a soccer version uh, played on, solely on asphalt without boards. Uh, so you have to have really great foot control, ball control. And uh, so we'll be doing that. We'll be uh, working, um, you know, a lot of this falls under uh, Lincoln and TJ and David. And then we're super excited about updating our master park plan. So there's a there's clearly been a lot going on in parks and I thought I would just cover some of the, the bigger projects. Uh, I mentioned that I had a um, significant announcement and I hinted at this last month, but we'll be celebrating um, at a block party from two to six, Saturday, October 2nd, uh, adjacent to Westside Park and Lowell School when we will be announcing that we have met the silent phase goals of our um, capital campaign. And with David's announcement on the LWCF um, affirmation, um, we uh, did receive a million dollar uh, grant donation. We have a pending uh, $500,000 over five years pledge and a couple of large foundations. And so far, every one of those um, private donations, foundations, and grants have said that if we are somehow able to complete the capital improvements um, for less than the total money given or donated or contributed, we are allowed to put that into our Lowell Neighborhood Community Center Fund for operations and investment in human capital. That's so, awesome. Yeah, I'm so excited about that. Um, you know, with, with this board and, and just really a special hat, you know, thanks to, to Wendy, um, our work in diversity, equity, and inclusion has really um, driven the way we've been uh, doing our work and where we're placing our priorities and how we're making our investments and how we're making those recommendations to city council and quite fr frankly, how we're communicating with the public. And so it's going to be a huge piece or it's a, it's a significant investment in place and in people that the city is making. And uh, the really cool thing is that um, Lowell students in the past year, which is obviously just year one of a pilot program, um, had the gr uh, most significant percent increase in uh, academic success, especially in reading. So we're super excited about that. Um, we did get the um, JEDI resolution passed, the Just, Equitable, um, Diverse, and Inclusionary Missoula resolution passed, and so did the county. Uh, Jamar Galbraith took the county version forward. Um, Ashley Brittner Wells did uh, the bulk of the work for the city, and it's not a parks resolution, it is a city resolution. And now um, through the budget process, we have um, $10,000 from the National League of Cities, plus $150,000 in um, ARPA, uh, one-time ARPA funds to help us really look internally at all of the operations of the city and how we can be, um, how our policy can be more inclusionary. And to give the board a real specific example, you know, our board meets at lunch and a lot of working people uh, don't necessarily have the choice uh, if they're in the service industry to skip this time period and uh, leave work likely without pay, uh, find childcare. Uh, now we're in Zoom, so that's better. 
And so we're even working uh, for ways so to ensure that all people, regardless of their economic situation, would at least have the ability to participate in government and know that they're welcome to participate in government. With that in mind, um, I also uh, want to remember uh, to recognize Dave Westfall because Dave has only been with us a few months and he has been such a um, active participant um, in our park board meetings, uh, despite the fact we never got to have one outside of a Zoom environment. And uh, Dave uh, will be moving and we're gonna miss him greatly. And what it does do is it creates another opening. And so I didn't know, Dave, if you wanted to say anything to the board uh, today, uh, and I, I would pass the uh, baton to you if you would like to speak. Yeah, uh, thank you, Donna. Those are nice words and uh, yeah. Um, I did want to, you know, fill the board in on my uh, change in, in membership. Um, as some of you know, and probably most of you don't, my wife Tara and I will be moving out of our Lewis and Clark home. The, um, the, the, the good news is that we'll still be in uh, Missoula County. We're moving out to Tura, actually Tura Meadows, a little development out in Tura. But uh, the bad news is we will be moving out of the city. So I won't be able to serve on the Parks and Rec Board uh, past this month. And I do wanna just say that I have really uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. I've learned a lot uh, in a short period of time, just a number of months, but it's been, it's been short and sweet. And uh, I just wanna thank all of you for giving me the opportunity uh, to serve and to be on the board. Um, and you'll see more of me. I'll find something to do at the county, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. We'll miss you, Dave. Um, yeah, I miss all you guys too. Thanks. Some other big uh, projects, uh, Waterworks Trailhead, uh, Neil has completed the bid process. We're looking to assemble um, a sufficient amount of cash. Uh, projects are pretty difficult right now uh, with the um, construction market. And uh, I, I think we're doing everything we can to be um, as flexible as possible with contractors so that we're getting reasonable numbers. Um, when we don't get reasonable numbers uh, based on other projects going on and around the community, we are not uh, moving those projects forward. In this case, we are looking to move Waterworks Trailhead forward. Um, and then uh, some of the demo work could start as soon as this fall and then uh, continue on into the spring. So we could end up with 40 new parking spots and a nice new universally accessible trail. Our Marshall Mountain kickoff celebration on Sunday was well received. We had somewhere in the neighborhood of 750 visitors. Uh, lots and lots of big, big smiles. Uh, it was kind of fun for me. I had a number of folks um, who are uh, slightly older than me come up to me and say, I grew up here. I can't believe we might get to save this mountain. And they were so ecstatic, as well as very, very young uh, individuals in our community who uh, grew up also uh, in Zootown derailers biking on that mountain. So that was exciting. Um, Dean Stone, as you know, has been open for the summer. And I think Jeff and his team has done an outstanding job of managing and addressing some of the parking um, and related challenges at the Sousa Trail. Uh, Bar Myers settled down a little bit, although from time to time we are seeing overflow parking. And uh, I did finally get to hike it this weekend. Uh, if you have not been up there, wonderful views in every single direction, uh, wonderful ecosystem to walk through. I think the team did a fantastic job of signage, feel very comfortable wherever you are. And it is about a four and a half hour walk uh, to do the whole thing. Um, but hats off to, to Jeff and Morgan and, and their team working with Five Valleys and MTB to make that, and many, many other partners, as well as the original landowners to make that happen. So that's uh, taken a fair amount of time. We um, are uh, continue to work with uh, North Side and West Side, and uh, we have the North Side uh, Park Annex, which we hope to go to planning this winter on that project. Uh, we will be submitting a CDBG CV. Uh, CV stands for Community Violence. Uh, it comes out of the uh, uh, larger CARES and ARPA funds, in this case CARES. And uh, it we would be aiming that at downtown Lions Park uh, because of 
uh, the low moderate income, uh, the kinds of activities, it's basically an empty lot, though irrigated uh, grass is there. And we have a partnership with um, NADA, Native Americans Against Drugs and Alcohol. And so we intend for that to have a um, area tribal focus. And so we're pretty excited about that. We recently awarded Karis Park Phase One. It was a huge partnership with um, Missoula Stormwater. Uh, they are installing an infiltration gallery under what we all fondly refer to as the mound. Uh, the mound will uh, be returned to a grass lawn with a surround seat wall that can be used for lawn games, uh, uh, increasing seating. And we were able to award the rest of the project or what was called Schedule B, which is to redo the amphitheater. And what that'll do for us is it will, um, it'll improve our septed crime prevention through environmental design. I don't know how many of you have ever sat in the, in the uh, stage or the seating, the amphithe amphitheater seating, um, and know that there's people kind of hanging out behind that can't be seen uh, by lowering the mound in the seating. So it's more level with the trail. We will actually have better views of the river and the mountains uh, across the way. Uh, as well as improve safety and, uh, and surveillance visibility. And uh, we will be improving ADA uh, lighting and all, all kinds of things just in that little part of the park. Uh, that project will kick off the 1st of October. Uh, we're also partnering with the downtown uh, partnership and uh, Destination Missoula and others for an ARPA um, economic development um, grant opportunity around outdoor recreation and tourism. Uh, we'd like to focus that on some more improvements in the Karis Park area, including the major uh, river access point down towards uh, from Karis Park proper to Brandon's Wave. Uh, we think that'd be a huge improvement. We continue to advance the Clark Fork River um, Access and Restoration Project. Uh, we should have a little bit more of an update. We're getting close to about 60% 60, 60 design. Uh, so sometime this winter, we'll have uh, more information for you on how that's uh, working out. We have Grant Carlton working on um, easement acquisitions. So we can expand open space bond funds to do the restoration and river access work we need to do. Uh, let's see, Meg and um, has been extremely busy uh, with the Lowell Neighborhood Center and after school programs and um, bringing on our, our new vans and a couple of um, staff. Marshall Mountain, along with what John mentioned earlier, uh, Fort Missoula Ponds is going to be able to, that with the two vans and the two staff will help us increase our capacity for out of school and summer camp programs. Uh, I've mentioned this a few times, but we had 3.5 registrants for every open uh, camp session this summer. And so we can, we can only incrementally increase that each year, but having transportation and staffing and places to actually take people is uh, necessary to increase capacity. Um, we have a wonderful relationship with the U.S. Forest Service at, at every level. Um, and they've been uh, fantastic. We're working with them on Marshall Mountain, uh, a ranger, uh, a bike ranger program, the rattlesnake dams and permits. And of course permits, there are only so many available uh, on the Lolo district. So Marshall Mountain and, and Four Ponds will help us uh, meet some of those goals. We just had um, Ben Carson uh, join us as our urban forester. He just started this week. Uh, ben was our urban forester about 10 years ago for a couple of years. And then uh, he went over to the University of Montana and uh, has come back uh, home, we like to say. And we're delighted to have him. We just had a new employee, um, Spencer McCorkle, had to leave for personal family reasons in June. And uh, we have hired uh, Brian Hilderbund. Hildebrand, uh, I just got to meet Brian right before this meeting for the first time. And so he'll uh, be starting with us in managing Fort Missoula uh, Playfair and McCormick uh, athletic and events venues and working with all of our, what I call our Uber user groups. Um, the turf working group process, um, TJ and 
um, Link and Shirley and, and Brian will be putting together um, some recommendations to this board. Um, we'll take those first back to the turf working group. So we're taking their ideas, putting them into policy or protocols, and then um, getting their hopeful th thumbs up and then we'll bring it to park board as part of our overall fee structure this fall. So that's all advancing. Um, I'm sure I've missed um, many, many areas of work uh, that we've been engaged, uh, but that touches a little bit on some of the things we've got going on right now. Thank you, Donna. We're, we're up on our two o'clock time. So if anybody has to leave, uh, I sure understand it, but otherwise, if anybody has any questions for Donna, Well, two quick things. It's Wendy. And Donna, you mentioned the city adopting um, the DEIJ um, stuff. And I, I just, I remember you talking to the parks board about the opportunity for parks to lead the city. And you really did that. Um, and when that was passed, that was a huge accomplishment with uh, big kudos to you. And the other thing is just take us back to the beginning of this call. And when you listen to the names of the people who have gotten that life, Lifetime Conservation Award in Missoula, that's a very short list and it's a very impressive list. And it's just, it's, I, I just, I'm so <laughs> glad to see your name there because you really do deserve it so much. So thanks again, as always, for all you do. Thank you, Wendy. Here, here. You all know nothing's possible without all of us pulling together. All right, uh, if there aren't any more questions, I would uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn, this is Wendy. All those in favor, aye. All right, aye. thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.